Hey everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Linux and Open Source News Show. This week we've got a new initiative to make better KD applications, something that is really needed. We've got GNOME announcing they had some major trouble with how they were handling the Sovereign Tech Fund project, but apparently it's all solved now and they're actually expanding this initiative to bring in more contract work to the GNOME Foundation. And we also have the EU investigating OpenAI for potential GDPR violations, which is a, another investigation against AI, but in a really different area. So I think it's going to be interesting. And we also have the usual segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Chasm Workspaces, a great project for streaming apps, operating systems and desktops straight to your browser. The latest software release includes support for auto-scaling on the OpenStack hypervisor. This feature lets you dynamically allocate more resources for streaming workspaces on OpenStack in your home lab or in the cloud with their partner OpenMetal. This basically lets you move off Windows VDI on Citrix or VMware Horizons and you can try out OpenStack orchestrated Linux desktops streamed directly to your browser. And of course, the Chasm Workspaces Community Edition can be self-hosted or run in any cloud VPC. To learn more about what Chasm Workspaces can do and to see a video on how to set it up entirely, click the links in the description. So first, let's talk KDE. Carl Schwann, a prolific contributor to many KDE applications, has launched a new initiative to make the KDE app ecosystem better. This KDE apps initiative has a few major goals. First, they want to close the feature gap. While Windows, macOS, Android, iOS, and even GNOME have tons of small applications that do little tasks very well, KDE has always had more monolithic applications that tried to do everything but weren't suited to small one-shot tasks. Since KDE already has access to all the underlying libraries needed to perform these small tasks, all they need are GUIs to go on top of these. So this is a relatively easy thing to do if developers are interested. Then there's the improvement to existing apps. They're mostly feature complete, but sometimes they have pretty old or unwieldy user interfaces that really need a big refresh. The initiative would also improve how these apps are marketed with a weekly post covering all the changes similar to what GNOME does. They also want to make it easier to start a new KDE app with better templates and with tools similar to GNOME Workbench. And they also want to support more languages than just C++. And I think this is a great idea. GNOME absolutely undeniably has the edge when it comes to the number and the quality of the apps with libadvita and with all workbench and the tooling that they've had in place basically it's super easy to write a new gnome app that does one little thing well when writing a kd app seems a bit more complicated even though things are improving so if we can see better revamped and brand new kd apps that rival the breadth and the quality of the gnome ecosystem then i think we will all benefit Speaking of GNOME, they announced early this week that they were facing an issue with the Sovereign Tech Fund project, what they called a major issue on the GNOME Foundation site, but they just didn't give any details about this. Fortunately, they posted an update right as I was starting to record this video to confirm that those problems are now solved. They still did not explain what the issue was. But the work on these projects will be continuing and GNOME will even expand its various initiatives to do more work along the lines of what they are doing with the Sovereign Tech Fund. They actually hired a new program manager to handle these projects, which makes me think the major issue was that no one communicated any progress to the STF directly and the STF got worried that they had been swindled out of their money. It is just pure speculation, I have no idea, but a failure in communicating progress might be the major issue they were talking about. Gnome also wants to expand the work being done, with a process to let the community give suggestions for work that is needed, and a process for companies or organizations to offer grants to fund that work. The Gnome Foundation applied to the Open Tech Fund as well, that's an American non-profit focused on supporting projects that go for a more open approach around tech. And the foundation will also apply for more contract funding with the STF in mid-June. Finally, they launched a development fund to raise more funds through the community. 
And on top of that, it looks like they managed to balance the books, to reorganize a few things, and they will apparently not be operating at a deficit this year, which is nice. So GNOME seems to be going really well. They solved the problems that they had in terms of organization. They are apparently looking for way more funding avenues to do way more work, which is also really great. And yeah, who could have guessed that hiring someone with actual experience running non-profits would be a good choice uh, to run a non-profit? Who, who knew? Okay, so the EU is looking into potential GDPR breaches in ChatGPT, especially in the data it scraped off of the internet. The Data Protection Board has analyzed the practices from OpenAI and they found some problematic things, not only in how it scraped content, but also in the accuracy of the data it displays. And they even received some complaints about ChatGPT's hallucinations, which they are investigating as well. So this is all just starting, but there are already a few interesting things. The main one is linked to the GDPR. Companies that operate in the EU need to either have the individual's consent to gather data about them, or they need a legitimate interest to gather this without consent. Since OpenAI cannot really ask for your consent for scraping data online that might be about you, for example, your public Facebook profile, they're relying on the legitimate interest use case. And this is being contested. A privacy expert seems to think that this legitimate interest has been completely distorted and doesn't apply here. Especially since the GDPR stipulates companies should make all the information they grabbed in this manner publicly available so everyone can check that this information collection is actually legitimate. OpenAI doesn't do this at all, meaning it's all a black box and no one can know what they gathered. The second issue is hallucinations. The GDPR stipulates that all information you can get about EU citizens should be accurate. So when you ask a question to ChatGPT about a specific person, it shouldn't tell you things that it imagined. The issue is current AI generative tools cannot abide by that rule. They are by nature inventing things because they don't understand most of the context of what they read or what they assimilated to train themselves. Now this is just the beginning of this inquiry and it only ended in broad advice that will have virtually no impact. It's basically, hey OpenAI, put some safeguards and implement some measures to fix this, but leaving this to OpenAI will result in nothing good. So let's hope that this will go further, that they will actually manage to start regulating this type of technologies and that this time we won't wait for these companies to be gigantic when we start trying to regulate them because that did not work with Google, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon and the like and it still will not work with the likes of OpenAI if they ever reach the same kind of size. So take this right now, fix the problems right now and then when they're big they will already have a solid framework so we can make sure that they work in an ethical way, sort of. Now, the Fedora mirrors are apparently being heavily strained by millions of requests coming from AWS. Fedora hosts the mirrors for the EPEL system, the extra packages for enterprise Linux. Those are basically sort of PPAs for Red Hat and Red Hat based distros. And these mirrors have seen a surge in traffic. More than 5 million new systems pulling packages from the repos or just pulling the repos for available packages which basically doubled the amount of connections in a few months. The source is very clearly Amazon with traffic from AWS surging like crazy. Fortunately, Amazon engineers are apparently looking at the issue to see what happened and to try and fix it. This is apparently not linked to people migrating from CentOS 7 or Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 to another distro which would require these repos. That surge would not have lasted that long if this had been the case. Now, you know what could be cool? If a giant hosting company could actually host mirrors and use those mirrors for their own distributions instead of relying on a community hosted project and not contributing to it as far as I could tell. That would be really nice. And Microsoft really seems to want to continue with their Windows subsystem for Linux, the thing that lets you run Linux on a Windows system through the terminal or even through running graphical apps. 
they have announced a few new things for WSL, like automatically releasing the memory used by WSL to the underlying Windows system, which is strange because it seems to implicate that WSL did not do that before, so it just gobbled up RAM until you restarted your computer or completely closed WSL. Kind of badly designed. More importantly, Microsoft is bringing a graphical settings app to configure WSL, meaning you won't have to use a text file anymore, thus probably making Unix diehard fans even more mad about the existence of WSL because they're even moving away from text configurations. Now, you can still use the text file to configure things if you prefer or if you need to. Windows users will also get a new environments feature, letting you create, manage, and launch development environments, probably sort of like a VM manager, but just for WSL. And okay, I know a lot of people don't like WSL and they think it's a play from Microsoft to embrace, extend, extinguish Linux, but for now, the data seems to point out it had zero impact on Linux's growth because the Linux desktop has been growing faster than ever and it kind of started when Microsoft introduced WSL, so yeah, really weird. Anyway, personally, I think WSL is just another way that we're cementing Linux's position as the right option for development. Even if your company forces you to use Windows, you can still use the better development OS, which is Linux, and so it just cements the fact that Linux is the OS that you should use to develop, even if it's just through WSL and not installed on bare metal. And let's move on to the gaming news. The Steam Deck passed the 15,000 games mark, as in 10,000 games are playable and about 5,000 games are verified, with 4,000 more being marked as unsupported. Recently verified titles include Rogue Trader, something I absolutely want to play because I love this type of game, but I was completely uninvested in Baldur's Gate 3 setting and story and characters. They were just bland and uninteresting to me. And don't get all mad, it's just that I always prefer science fiction and the universe of Warhammer 40k to anything fantasy based. It's, it's on me, it's not on the game. And the data around the Steam Deck still seems to show that it's selling like hotcakes, as it's consistently in the top 3 or top 5 sellers on Steam since the beginning of the year, meaning it probably sells tens of thousands of units every week. That's a really good thing for Linux gaming, the more people use this, the more developers will focus on supporting it, and the more games we'll have on Linux in general. Now, I personally haven't been using my Steam Deck all that much for a while now, I've been just concentrating on working on my Warhammer 40k armies for a while, but with Rogue Trader being officially verified on it, I will probably pick it back up and start a playthrough of this fantastic game. And Wine 9.10 was also released this week, with improvements to their VKD3D version to better support DirectX 12 games. They also improved DPI awareness, meaning high DPI displays should be better supported by apps and games running with Wine. The ARM work also continued, as well as the removal of legacy Wine D3D features that were obsolete. 18 bugs were also fixed in this version for games like Silent Hill 4, Far Cry 3, Horizon Zero Dawn, Metro Exodus, or the EA Launcher, and also for apps like Affinity Photo or Paint.net. And as always, those improvements to Wine will at some point reach a version of Proton that will be distributed directly to you by Steam. Just like I'm distributing this segue to our sponsor directly to you. Tuxedo Computers makes laptops, desktops, and any kind of computer running Linux out of the box. They're based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world, and they have a nice big range of devices that support Linux perfectly, from small ultrabooks for office work all the way up to gaming laptops, gaming towers, or giant workstations. They have something for everyone, and they are very customizable in terms of the components. You can have your own logo engraved on your laptop, you can change the keyboard layout as well, and all the laptops can be opened, repaired, and upgraded as well. I only use Tuxedo computers these days. My channel is run on one of their Infinity Book Pro 16, and my gaming is done on one of their Tuxedo Cubes. So if you need a new computer, you want to run Linux, you want to support a company that actually develops drivers and supports Linux, click the link in the description below and get yourself a computer from Tuxedo. They're really, really good. 
Okay, so thanks everyone for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, all the YouTube pleasantries are still there. Like, subscribe, comment, whatever. You know how this works. And if you really enjoyed the channel, you can become a YouTube member or a Patreon subscriber and you'll get a daily version of this show from Monday to Friday so you don't have to wait for the end of the week. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!